the universe is all one. So there's, or cosmos, the Greeks would have called it cosmos. Universe is a Latin expression. So cosmos, one. And as a result, his follower Zeno is famous for paradoxes. We're familiar with Zeno's paradoxes, everyone. You can't uh, 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 really move if this is correct, because uh, of course you end up with uh, all sorts of interesting paradoxes. Um, Lots of different images. I, I just use this one here, for example, is an archer who's trying to shoot an arrow at this person. In order for the arrow to travel from the bow to the person, it has to first travel half the distance, right? Half that distance, half that distance, half that distance. Ad infinitum, and as a result, the arrow is never going to be able to reach the target. It seems silly because, of course, the arrow does always hit the target. It hits something. You never stop in midair. Ran out of gas. Right? You know, I always travel to the, the stopping point. But mathematically, it certainly seems like it's impossible. Aristotle will answer that, by the way, by pointing out that you can have two contexts. One context makes it, you know, by, by mixing the context, you end up with this. Wait, how can it be? Well, that if you think, well, if we're talking a finite amount of space, then we have to think in a finite amount of time. And then there's no problem. If you're thinking it's an infinite distance, then you have to give it an infinite time, and in which case, well, there's no real problem either. So the problem is, again, thinking and creating a paradox by mixing two different contexts and thinking that the answer must satisfy both contexts. Empedocles comes up with the idea of putting a bunch of the arcades already suggested into one group. So you end up with fire, earth, air, and water. I have trouble when I order a glass of water. I'm from Philly, so I say water. I've had waitresses look at me and say, we don't have that. We don't have any water? No. Ah, agua? Yes. Oh, okay. My pronunciation is on the Don's screw. So I can talk like I'm from Philly, you know. That's how it works. You know. Rocky. Rocky. You know. How many folks know the Rocky? Oh, I, I know one of these days these references would just totally be no one knows. Um, but, and, uh, also, by the way, that's a great name for a band. Okay, nobody gets that one. It was a band. It was a band, yes. But there's no fire. No, they didn't have all of them. Water. water was missing. Earth, air, fire. Fire, earth, air. Uh, well. Wait, earth, wind, fire? Yeah, there you go. That's it. I never listened to them as far as I know. But Democritus. Deme means people. Uh, um, kratia means power. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. His idea was, we'll go back to the atoms, the uncuttable. Um, then there were sophists, and sophists, Sophia is wisdom, so these sophists were wisdom teachers that would go around and teach for money. And their main claim to fame was that they would help young men, who weren't really there for women, to teach them how to speak out in court or in the forum and basically explain things in a very beautiful language so that they would win and get elected to high offices and so on. So rich men would pay these sophists to teach their children, their sons, how to speak. And so they made a lot of money there, and some of them were pretty famous. Some of the ones in the dialogues of Plato, where Socrates is arguing with them, 
are sophists. So that's an interesting thing. But along then comes Socrates. And Socrates is different. There's something unique about him. And if you listen, make a comparison, because this seems to have happened simultaneously in three places throughout the world. At the same, well, simultaneously means at the same time. And that was Socrates in Greece, Master Kung, or Confucius, in China, and the Buddha in India. Buddha Siddhartha. Get that Buddha. That Buddha. Um, Buddha is interesting because he sits under a Bodha tree. Not the same exact spelling, usually, but of course I don't speak Hindi. But in, in any case, he had tried out all the gods and discovered that none of them were right. And so he rebelled against all of them and sitting under the tree became enlightened and realizing that none of them were right. And, and what was the best way to live was to divorce yourself from all attachments to physical things. Because it's the attachment to the physical that corrupts us and causes pain and suffering. Happiness too, but nonetheless, got to get rid of both the happy and the sad together. You can't keep just the happy and get rid of the sad. They go together. Pandora's box is a Greek a version of, it, of that same dilemma. Pandora means all of the gifts. Right? So if you open the box, all of the gifts come out, and guess what? You don't just get the good ones, you get the bad ones too. They come out uh, together. Uh, the fall, Adam and Eve in the garden, don't, don't you eat the fruit of this tree or you will, you will die. You'll, you'll also know the difference between good and evil, right? And if you think about it, that's knowing the gifts, right? You know, until you open the, the box, until you bite the apple, well, we say apple, they didn't have apples there, so whatever the fruit was, right? until you bite the fruit, you don't know the good and the evil. So the, the fall is when we become aware of both good and evil, in a sense, right? Um, and you want to escape the evil uh, and, and just have the good, and that never, never works, right? Um, So for Buddha, you get rid of all attachment to physical things. Socrates is pretty similar, uh, walking through the town, seeing all the shops and saying, all this stuff I don't need. Famously wearing just kind of raggedy clothing, um, barefoot, you know, not, not really needing anything, begging for his food and so on even though he was married and had kids. I mean, that was a problem, obviously. Um, he officially was a sculptor and had sculpted a beautiful statue that was in uh, the middle of, of Athens at the time. List lasted there apparently for something like 500 years before some, somehow it was destroyed. And the, the statue that he had made for that, by the way, was known as the Three Graces. So we have no no clue what it actually his statue looked like, but you can see that every artist practically has to do some version of the Three Graces. I think they still do. They were meant to be the idealized virtues of a woman. So apparently there would need to be three of them, and that would enable the household to run perfectly well and keep everybody happy. So they idealized this three graces. Notice when uh, the Christian period begins, Mary is full of grace, and you only get one female icon uh, for the perfect woman. Yes? That. Okay. So, 
but what um, and Master Kung, I should mention uh, as well, uh, in a in a harder way to see it, is is rebelling against this same kind of thing, but creating the rules for a well efficient uh, efficient bureaucracy. Uh, so all three of them are known by the axial age. For some reason, this particular time period is considered an axial age. Um, Carl Jaspers coined that phrase. Axial, you know, the, the hub, uh, you know, the wheel runs on the ax axis, so the axial age, a major turn happens. And what what's going on here that is drastically different? Why is Socrates beginning a, a philosophy that's critical of what's gone before by bringing the concern to how to live a good life. What are the virtues? What's the best way to live, basically? And, and so a moral turn uh, that they all seem to be doing. And um, I'll use another interesting uh, Da, 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 da. How many folks know about the um, the invention of um, the bicameral mind by Julian Joyce? Maybe I'm not spelling. Bicameral means like two cameras, two rooms. Let's, let's try a different one. Marsh McLuhan, tricameral. You could find it. I, I, I don't want to spend too much time looking for it. It should have come right up. But Julian James, the origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. You know, we have two lobes, corpus callosum in the middle, which is the interesting fibers that connect both sides. By the way, everyone knows, I hope, that at six months in the womb, if the child is a male child, the corpus callosum does this and shrinks suddenly. As a result, the amount of information that goes from both sides to one another is severely lessened compared to the normal fetus, which is the female, right? Yes. So you can tell the difference between a male and female brain. By the way, that doesn't necessarily mean that the individual will behave male or female uh, it's not necessary. I mean, you can have female brained individuals that are male and male brained individuals that are female, etc. Right? Uh, and what causes that, it seems, stresses on the woman during pregnancy can make that happen or cause that problem uh, if it's a problem. Okay? Uh, and the concern is that. Uh, um, Males are dumber as a result, you know? And, and, you know, and, and you can see it in lots of effects later on in life as a result. Um, so let's, let's, that's a whole other topic, so let's, let's skip that one. But there's books out there if you're interested. Some of the, the ones I'm familiar with are pretty darn old, um, but like Brain Sex, you've ever heard of that one? It's another book, I'll throw that up there in case people are interested. And more, I believe. Well, the whole book is on there, looks like. Internet Archive. Hmm. Okay, well, that's interesting. So you can read that if you're interested. I'm sure they've got lots more information now on what happens today because that was fairly old, and you know, brain sciences are going 
It's so fast you can't keep up with it. But Julian James comes up with this idea in the what late 90s, I guess, that at a certain point, the mind has evolved to the point where we're aware of our thoughts. <coughs> you're all doing that, right? Everybody thinks things, and while you're thinking those things, you're aware that you're thinking those things, right? Do any of you wonder if the thoughts you're thinking are coming from an invisible source? Explain. Oh, um, there's many times that thoughts pop into my head and I go, I wonder what caused that thought. Oh, okay. I agree and with I you on that. We don't know where they're all coming from, but you don't yeah. think, who said that? No, there's moments of that. Some people do. You have lots of people, actually, that hear voices. Yes? Should they? My voice. <laughs> you hear, you're, well, I, hear, I can hear my 